What up YouTube, TK here, and today we are installing a wideband oxygen sensor in the MX-5. Let's go. So the reason we're doing this is because, as you've probably seen in the previous video, the MX-5's oxygen sensor is dead. Now, we could replace that with a stock one, but the thing is, we're going to mega squirt this car eventually. There's no point wasting money on a stock one when we need to wideband later anyway. Let's unbox this and get going. Now, the wideband we are installing today is an Innovate Motorsports LC2 with the DB gauge. Some free air from China. Breathe that in. Tastes good. Now, we have a gauge. This is just a simple seven-segment display, which displays our air fuel ratio. We have a eight-foot cable for use with a Bosch 4.9 oxygen sensor. We have the delicious... Gorgeous Bosch 4.9 oxygen sensor here. Again, with a big cable on it. In here, I believe we have a, yes, we have the controller. Now this is what runs the show. This talks to the oxygen sensor, heats it up, cools it down, figures out what the air fuel ratio is. It then pumps it out over these yellow and brown wires as an analog voltage. One of these will go to the gauge and one of these will go to the stock ECU. Now, because we're using the stock ECU, the output there will be emulating a narrowband sensor. When we eventually switch over to a mega squirt, we will have both outputs obviously acting as proper wide bands. We've got to hook all this up. Well, they've even given us a sticker. Very nice, that'll go on the hard top. And we also have a four pin serial programming cable. Very cool. This is a, what is this? Ah, uh, this is a bung, 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 bung. Yes, this is a bung. Now, this is for welding into your exhaust system if it doesn't have a bung already. Ours does, and I've been told that the Bosch sensor should thread straight in. Let's have a gander at the manual. Now, one of the main things I'm interested in is how to wire this up, obviously. One of the main things with wideband oxygen sensors is they're always dying in aftermarket applications. OEM oxygen sensors will last for well over 100,000 kilometers, and yet you'll hear about people using these Bosch sensors, and they'll last sometimes less than two hours, and they'll, they'll blow them up. One of the things that I have learned from research online, and I've thrown the link down in the description, is that a big deal with these oxygen sensors is water. What can happen is, if you start your car on a cold morning, water vapor, or indeed actual water droplets, have settled in the exhaust. And when you start the car, they're blown out. Now, if your wideband controller has heated the oxygen sensor and the engine's just started and is blowing all that water and water vapor out, what can happen is the water hits the hot ceramic components in the oxygen sensor, causes them to crack due to the heat stress, and then your oxygen sensor is dead and you've got to buy a new one. One of the best things I've heard to do is to actually turn the wideband controller and the oxygen sensor on around about 30 seconds after startup. However, since we're using a stock ECU, you know, I can't really be bothered setting up some big complicated thing. So we're just pretty much going to follow the manual for now. But that is something I'm going to do when I go to Mega Squirt later. You can even see here, there's a reference to mounting the oxygen sensor. And if you choose a low position in the exhaust, condensation can actually damage the sensor's heating elements. So that's exactly what we're talking about. So fairly basic. We need power and we have two outputs. There's a serial in and out and then there's a cable that goes to the sensor. Fairly straightforward. You've just got black and red, which are your 12 volt power, which we'll be using as ignition on. We don't want it on all the time. You've got serial in and out, which we probably won't need to worry about for today. And then you've got the cable that goes to the sensor. Should be easy enough. Just to be careful though, we're not gonna wanna leave the car sitting with the key on for long periods, especially on cold days, unless the engine is started. But that's just something to remember when you've got a modified car. Now, as far as the analog outputs go on the yellow and brown wires, by default, the yellow output is a proper wideband output, zero volts equals 7.35 AFR and five volts equals 22.4. And the brown wire is the emulated narrowband. We'll wire the brown one into the stock ECU, which is expecting a narrowband, and we'll wire the yellow one to the gauge so we can see our true AFRs. Very cool. Now, before we go wiring this all up in the car, it makes sense to do the free air calibration on the bench because we're here. So to do this, we're going to hook up the LC2 to a power supply. So to start the calibration, we power it up with no sensor connected and watch it flash for a while. All right, now that it's been flashing this error two code for over 30 seconds, we power it down and go ahead and plug in the oxygen sensor, including the special 
lead. All right, so we will plug this in. It should only go in one way with a satisfying click. Take the cover off, leave it in free air, and go ahead and restore power to the device. And it should flash in a cheery way. It appears to be flashing in the correct manner. And basically, if we leave this for a couple of minutes, it should do its thing and then light up solid green and we'll know it's done calibrating. So we'll just let that run. Yeah. Now, I'm told it'll get hot, so you may just want to lean it on something because otherwise you'll burn your desk down. Something I didn't actually really think of. And we can now see that this is reading solid green, which indicates the calibration is complete. So we can switch it off and set about installing it in the car. Now, we're removing the stock oxygen sensor to put the new one in. And you can see probably why it hasn't been working it's been spliced in, probably because of the custom headers, with one of these dodgy wire splices. It's just absolute butchery, which is really stupid when you're talking about crucial sensors for the car. So I'm glad we are actually replacing this crap. And if yours is anything like mine, it'll be an absolute pig to remove. Just go back and forth with it, use a bit of WD-40, and eventually you'll get her out. What is great as well is the new sensor is actually pre-coated with some grease that will help stop it seizing. Now, one of the hardest parts of this install is feeding the cables through the firewall. Now, on a car like mine, a 1990 Australian NA6, you might find it difficult. You've only got eight feet of cable to play with for the sensor. So, if we come down here in the passenger footwell, on the left-hand side of the car, you'll see this grommet here. Now, I don't know what this is for, but it's simply a piece of rubber pipe that dumps outside the car we're going to feed our sensor line right here. And that should be nice and easy for us because I literally cannot find anywhere else. So here's the other side of the grommet next to the gearbox. We're gonna slam our sensor cable through there and it shouldn't be a problem. I doubt this will be that easy. It turns out the best way to use this grommet is to actually completely pull this tube out of the grommet, feed your oxygen sensor cable through and then you can put that tube back where it goes and that is how you do it doing it that way is much easier than the alternative of trying to shove both through at once but you know it's a learning process now that we have the sense cable in the cabin it's a simple job of passing it up over this hump and into the stereo cavity where we're installing the wideband so because we're installing the wideband in this stereo area and we don't have a stereo I'm feeling pretty safe to actually use the stereo's power wiring to run the wideband. It shouldn't be a problem. If you did have a stereo, you'd be much better off running a separate lead from the battery or a relay or whatever, a full setup. But for our purposes, this should be fine. I'm not too worried about it. Now, it may look like a total mess in here, and in a way it is. But now that it's time to wire the controller and gauge up, it actually couldn't be more simple. We have this red wire here, and this is 12 volts that is switched with the ignition. So when the ignition key is put to on, we get 12 volts here. That's going to this red wire for the controller and the other red wire on this gauge harness. Easy. Ground is the same, goes to black on the controller harness and on the gauge harness. We then connect the yellow wire from the controller to the white wire for the gauge. That feeds the air fuel reading to the gauge. We then connect the brown wire back through the firewall to the original O2 sensor connector for the stock ECU, because that's a bit easier than rooting around under the dash for the ECU's pinout. Now, that leaves only this yellow wire on the gauge harness. Now, that's for connecting to the headlight power for dimming the gauge automatically at night. I can't be bothered, it's late, and this has been hard enough already. We're just gonna leave that out. We also have the sensor cable feeding through, and we will connect that to our controller. All right, we've now got switch power hooked up to the gauge and the controller. Same thing, we have ground hooked up to the gauge and controller, and then we have the white lead of the gauge hooked up to the yellow lead of the controller. Next order of business is to hook up this brown wire to a much longer lead, which we can then feed back through here all the way through to the engine bay to hook up to the original oxygen sensor harness. So we have the original oxygen sensor wire here. Now to get to this, we're actually first going to come through the main wiring grommet on the driver's side 
Keeping in mind we're in Australia here. We're going to feed this brown wire through a little slit in that and that should be easy to work with. We'll just make a small incision and poke our wire through. We can see our wire has gone in neatly there. We're just going to pull it through on the other side. Look at that, easy as pie. We'll just feed that through the stereo area and wire it up to the controller. All right, it's the moment of truth. We've wired up the controller, we've wired up the gauge. All we have to do now, is screw this into the exhaust and plug this in, and then we're ready to test. Wish me luck. That's where it's gonna go. And if we're lucky, it'll screw straight in. We've got it seated. The trick is to just get it lined up properly and gently screw it in. You do not want to cross thread this because you'll have no end of hurt. So there we can see our glorious sensor is finally installed. It was pretty tough. I actually ended up using this old random sensor from another car as a tap to sort of chase the threads because once I took the stock one out, it was really, really chewed up in there. So I basically used this one to tap or chase the threads. And then I was able to get that in there seated nicely. So now all we have to do, connect these connectors and we should probably zip tie these out of the way somewhere. Then we're good to go. All right, this is it. This is actually it. We've plugged everything in. We're turning the car on. It appears to possibly be working. Holy crap, I need to actually think about this before I know what's going on, but... Well, it's doing something, I'm not sure. What's the what's the device doing? It's, it's flashing. What does that mean? I don't know. Maybe that's bad. Damn it. It looks like something's not working. Uh, everything's got power. Oh no, here we go. Here we go, look at that. That was probably it heating up. Look at that. Oh my God, it's actually working. This is fantastic. Okay, I'm gonna put everything back together and go and get some sleep because it's now 1 a.m. and we'll talk in the morning. Oh my God, it works. So this was one of those really rare examples of something actually working first time. I started the car and the wide band was working. I've had it installed for a couple of weeks now and it's been great. It's working reliably and I've had absolutely no problems whatsoever. Basically when you start the car as we can see here, it flashes 7.5. That's just the controller telling you that it hasn't actually got the oxygen sensor up to temperature yet and you can't trust the readings. After about a minute or so, it then transitions and shows you the proper air fuel ratio. Now we can see here that the car is initially running quite rich because the engine is cold around 10 or 11 to 1. That's pretty normal. And then if we transition to a little bit later once the car is warm, we can see the ECU and the oxygen sensor are working together perfectly. The mixture is dipping down to 14.7, overshooting a little to 14.6-ish, and then back up to just over 15, 15.1, and then back towards 14.7. We can actually see here quite clearly the controller is aiming to hit that stoichiometric mixture at 14.7 for a petrol burning engine and it's just hovering around that area. That's exactly the behavior you expect for a stock ECU to be doing at idle. Really brilliant to see that this install has gone smoothly. I'm loving the fact that it works. The two tricks that made this easy for me were one, finding that grommet where I could pass the cable through and two, using the old oxygen sensor from another car as a tap to recut the threads because my threads were absolutely shot. But overall, I hope you found this video useful. I had a great time and until next time, TK out.